Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video focuses on the section of the book titled Orthonormal Bases. Let's quickly review our standing assumptions. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. V denotes an inner product space over F. Now we are ready to give one of the important definitions in the theory of inner product spaces. A list of vectors in our inner product space V is called orthonormal if each vector in the list has norm 1 and is orthogonal to all the other vectors in the list. In the word orthonormal, the normal part means that each vector has norm 1, and the ortho part means the vectors are orthogonal to the other vectors in the list. Let's look at some examples. For our first example, the standard basis in Fn is an orthonormal list, where of course here we are using the standard inner product on Fn. For our second example, we'll use the standard inner product on F3, and the claim is the list shown here is an orthonormal list. So two things need to be verified. First, that each vector in the list has norm 1. Let's look just at the first vector. We compute its norm. We square each coordinate and then add them up, and we indeed get 1. Same thing for the second vector. Now we need to verify that these two vectors are orthogonal. That's just taking their inner product, the standard inner product on F3, and that clearly gives us 0. Thus, this is indeed an orthonormal list in F3. Our third example, shown here, is another orthonormal list in F3, this time an orthonormal list of length 3. Again, first step to verify that this is an orthonormal list is that you should verify that each of these vectors has norm 1. Pause the video for a moment if you need to do that. Then you should verify that the inner product of any two of these distinct vectors gives 0. Again, pause the video and please verify that. Orthonormal lists are important because they are particularly easy to work with. This result is the first indication of that. Suppose we have an orthonormal list E1 up to EM of vectors in our inner product space V. Then the norm squared of any linear combination of those vectors is equal to the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coefficients. The proof of this result follows easily from repeated applications of the Pythagorean theorem. As a consequence of our first result on this slide, we have the following result. Every orthonormal list of vectors is linearly independent. Let's look at the proof. Suppose E1 up to EM is an orthonormal list of vectors in V, and we have a linear combination of those vectors that equals 0. Then, by the first result on this slide, the sum of the squares of the absolute values of those coefficients equals 0. That means each of the coefficients is 0. And that's exactly what it means to be linearly independent. In other words, we can conclude that our orthonormal list of vectors is linearly independent, completing the proof. An orthonormal basis is defined to be an orthonormal list of vectors that is also a basis of our inner product space V. Our next result states that if we have an orthonormal list of vectors in V, and the length of that list is the dimension of V, then our list is an orthonormal basis of V. Here's the proof of that result. By the result on our previous slide, our orthonormal list of vectors is linearly independent. Now we saw earlier in these videos that if we have a linearly independent list whose length is the dimension of the vector space, then that linearly independent list is a basis. That completes the proof. Again, we've shown that every orthonormal list of vectors with the right length is an orthonormal basis of the vector space. Let's look at an example. Here's a list of four vectors in F4. It's easy to verify that this is an orthonormal list. You should pause the video for a minute so that you can verify to yourself that this list is indeed an orthonormal list in F4, of course using the standard inner product on F4. Because this orthonormal list has length 4, we can conclude by the last result that it is in fact an orthonormal basis of F4. When we have a basis of a vector space, 
Every vector in the vector space can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of the basis vectors. However, finding the coefficients in that linear combination can be difficult or perhaps even impossible. The wonderful feature of orthonormal bases is that it's easy to find the coefficients, and there's a specific formula for it, which is now shown here. This formula states that if we have an orthonormal basis E1 up to En of our inner product space V, and a vector V in our vector space, then our vector is linear combination with a coefficient shown here. The coefficient of Ej is the inner product of our vector with the jth basis vector. Very simple formula. We also have a formula for the norm squared of V, that is the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the coefficients. The last formula about the norm follows easily from the Pythagorean theorem, but let's see why the first equation holds about the coefficients. Because we have a basis, our vector v is a linear combination of the basis vectors. You can see we've written v as a1, e1, up to, plus a n, e n. Now take the inner product of both sides of that equation with e j on the right. On the left side of the equation, we get v inner product e j. And on the right side, we get just a sub j. That shows that the coefficient a sub j is equal to v inner product e j, completing the proof. Pause for a second and make sure you understand that proof before going on in the video. Because orthonormal lists are so easy to work with, it is important to have a procedure for generating orthonormal lists. Our next result, called the Graham-Schmidt procedure, gives the most widely used way of doing that. In the Graham-Schmidt procedure, we start with a linearly independent list of vectors in our inner product space V. The Graham-Schmidt procedure then gives us a formula for producing a new list. This new list will be an orthonormal list that has the same span as our original list of vectors. Even better than that, the span of the first j vectors in our original list is equal to the span of the first j vectors in our orthonormal list, as j ranges from 1 up to the length of our original list. The explicit formula for using the Graham-Schmidt procedure is shown in the slide here. Let's look at an example. Suppose V is the inner product space consisting of the polynomials with real coefficients and degree less than or equal to 2, where the inner product of two polynomials is given by multiplying them together and then integrating from negative 1 to 1. This inner product space, P2 of R, has a nice basis, 1, comma, x, comma, x squared. However, that basis is not orthonormal, so it's not as easy to work with as we might like. If the Graham-Schmidt procedure, shown at the left, is applied to the basis 1, comma, x, comma, x squared, it produces the orthonormal basis shown here. You may want to pause the video here and actually check that you can do the Gram-Schmidt procedure by producing the basis shown here. You should also read in the book the proof that the Gram-Schmidt procedure actually works. The Gram-Schmidt procedure allows us to conclude that every finite dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis. Here's the simple proof of that result. Suppose V is a finite dimensional inner product space. Choose a basis of V, then apply the Gram-Schmidt procedure to it, producing an orthonormal list with the same length. But we know that any orthonormal list is linearly independent. Thus, we have a linearly independent list whose length is the dimension of V. By a previous result, that linearly independent list is a basis of V. Hence, we have produced an orthonormal list that is a basis. The first result on this slide can be generalized to the following result. Suppose V is a finite dimensional inner product space. Then every orthonormal list of vectors in V can be extended to an orthonormal basis of V. Here's the proof of that result. Suppose we have an orthonormal list of vectors in V. Then that list is linearly independent. Hence it can be extended to a basis of V. Now apply the Gram-Schmidt procedure to that basis. That procedure will produce an orthonormal basis 
that is an extension of the original orthonormal list that we started with. Please see the details in the book. Our next result is called Schur's theorem. It states that on a finite dimensional complex inner product space, every operator has an upper triangular matrix with respect to some orthonormal basis of the vector space. Let's look at the proof. We are assuming that V is a finite dimensional complex inner product space. Let T be an operator on V. That means T is a linear map from V to V. As we discussed in an earlier video, T has an upper triangular matrix with respect to some basis of V. This is where we use the hypothesis that our scalar field is the complex numbers. We have displayed here a matrix showing what the matrix of T looks like with respect to this basis. Namely, it has only zeros below the diagonal. What's new about Schur's theorem, as compared to our previous result, is that we are asserting now that we can find an orthonormal basis such that the matrix of T also has this upper triangular form. The basis V1 up to Vn produced by our previous result might not be orthonormal. To get to an orthonormal basis with the right property, let's recall that the upper triangular form of the matrix of T happens precisely when the span of the vectors V1 up to Vj is invariant under T for each j from 1 up to n. You can see that readily from the form of the matrix. Now apply the Gram-Schmidt procedure to the basis V1 up to Vn, producing an orthonormal basis E1 up to En. Because the span of E1 up to Ej is equal to the span of V1 up to Vj for each j, we can conclude that the span of E1 up to Ej is invariant under T for each j because the V's had that property. Thus, T has an upper triangular matrix with respect to the orthonormal basis E1 up to En, completing the proof. Recall from a previous video that we defined a linear functional on V to be a linear map from V to the scalar field F. As an example of a linear functional on our inner product space V, fix a vector U in V, and define phi from v to f by phi of w equals w inner product u. Then phi is a linear functional on v as follows from the properties of an inner product. The next result is called the Reese representation theorem. It says that if v is finite dimensional, then every linear functional on v is the form we just saw in the last example. Specifically, suppose V is finite dimensional and phi is a linear functional on V. Then the Reese representation theorem says there is a unique vector U in V such that phi of W is equal to W inner product U for every W in V. You should be sure to read the proof of this theorem in the book. I want to make a comment about an interesting feature of the proof. Suppose E1 up to En is an orthonormal basis of V. The proof in the book shows that the vector u is given by the formula shown here. However, notice that the statement of the theorem says that the vector u is unique. But there is nothing unique about the choice of an orthonormal basis. Putting this together, we see that regardless of what orthonormal basis we choose, the formula on the right is unchanged. Again, please be sure to read and understand the proof shown in the book. This concludes the video on orthonormal bases.